welcome to another Monday Night Sonar Masterclass. Uh, thanks to Lawrence, and uh, with us today is Paul Malove. Welcome along, Paul. Nice to see you, mate. Thanks, Greg. Great to see you. Thanks for having <laughs> on the show. Yeah, look, it's uh, it's exciting to have you here because uh, yeah, we've chatted before on the podcast. You're a bit of a, a brim specialist. Uh, I don't know all that much about brim fishing, mate. So looking forward to uh, picking your brains, not just about sonar, but about uh, brim fishing in general. So uh, a good opportunity to do that. And we've had a few people that have submitted some questions, so that'll be great. I know we've got a lot of people that have uh, contacted me during the week saying they're looking forward to coming along to this one. So we're going to give them a few minutes or so, mate, to get into the room. Perfect. And, uh, Sounds and, good. And, and let this live stream get, get going. It takes a few minutes for it to uh, reach full swing. So, mate, let's have a bit of a chat about uh, brim fishing in your part of the world. So you're based in Melbourne. Um, I am, yeah. I'm, I'm Metro Melbourne, yeah. And the, and the key species down there, black brim, do you get the LFM in, in Melbourne as well? Or do no, they, they sort of stop Gippsland-ish area? Exactly, yeah, spot on. So down in Melbourne, um, we predominantly all oh, – the main brim species is the black brim. We don't get mm. the uh, the elephant coming down this far across. Uh, like you said, they kind of stop at, at Gippsland, potentially sail. Um, sail's about probably as, as far east as they might reach. You, you might get the occasional one at Wilson's Prom, but um, here in Melbourne, in Port Phillip Bay and Metro Melbourne, uh, it's always the black brim for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we've got a few guys already starting to fire up and send us a few <laughs> questions, Paul. So, folks, what I'll get you to do, we're just going to uh, chit-chat for a little bit. I'm going to have a fly land on my face. <laughs> we, we're going to chit-chat for a little bit. Got to love live TV, hey? <laughs> um, uh, just while things get going and people come into the room. But what I'd like you to do, guys, if you're listening in or watching the, the stream today, let us know where you're coming from. So we've got Rob Berlin. Uh, yes, mate, we are. It is working. Uh, Sudenko, uh, welcome along, mate. Scott Slater, Ben Martin. Now, Sudenko and Scott have um, posted some questions there, Paul. So we'll, we might come Perfect. back to those a bit later on. We're going to have plenty of time to talk about uh, lots of stuff. Uh, some of these questions are not necessarily going to be about sonar, but that's okay. So if you've got some general brim fishing questions, we're happy to talk about those as well. So, so mate, black brim in winter down in Melbourne, it's pretty cool down there. Do the fish keep biting right through the cooler months or do they uh, do they slow down a little bit? Definitely gets tough down here, Greg, especially in Metro, and this is what I wanted to talk about tonight on the show. Mm. Um, you know, if you go east or west of Melbourne, um, you definitely the, – the fishing's easier, let's say that. Let's put it that way. You've you still got to work for them. You've still got to find them. You've still got to – put the right presentation in front of them for them to get to, for them to eat. But I do find that those, maybe those systems just don't get as much pressure as well as some of these Melbourne metro areas, you know, mm. I'll throughout the night, I'll rattle off a couple of the systems. And a lot of the guys that follow me kind of know where I fish anyway around, you know, the Patterson Lake system, the Yarra, the Maribyrnong rivers, the Werribee rivers, they're kind of the, the four, four big systems. They're really close to us here in Metro Melbourne. And they really do slow down this time of year. The The water temperature really drops right down. Like we're down to about nine degrees. Um, early mornings are probably sevens if we've had a couple of cold nights. So mm. the the brim really do sit in, in very specific areas this time of year. And we'll talk about some of that. And we'll, we'll show the guys some of the screenshots that we've got prepared. And we'll yeah, have some we... great, great questions coming in, like you said. One from, from Benny Gibbs as well yeah. um, that we've I've just put together a little sort of pre prepared answer for that one but just talking through um you know the the technique and how long i'd spend on a particular school or a patch of fish and how i methodically go through different lure selections and different yep. techniques before i yeah, move on yeah. to the next one but Good um they're definitely still catchable this time of year but i find that the size probably increases but the quantity decreases for us okay Yep, so it's a trophy fish time of year. So you've already uh, partly answered Scott Slater's question, which was, uh, I think it was Scott, said, can you talk a bit about Pado? So, yeah, we can, Scott, yeah, no worries sure. at all. Um, Paul's already indicated he's going to do that. But if you've got specific questions, feel free, you know, as we go along through the evening, feel free to post those questions. Yeah. So um, we've got Kelvin, we've got Josh, we've got Shane, we've got Joel, we've got Alex. Uh, nice to have you guys along. So people starting to uh, come into the room now. So, um, Paul, we might Fantastic. even start. We might even start to show a few uh, screenshots, sure. hey, and we can talk about some of that stuff. So, mate, I'm just going to switch over to the other camera here. So bear with me a moment. Now, what I'll do is I'll actually make that full screen for a moment. I'll bring you back on in a moment, mate. But um, tell us what we're looking at there. Sounds good. So we're actually, this is a, um, a screenshot from Bem River from, from memory. Um, 
and what we've got here is quite an, quite an active school. So I've, I've chosen this particular uh, image or this screenshot. So this is a very common split screen for me personally. So a lot of the guys that have seen some of my screens before will kind of know the layout. Um, so in the top left-hand corner, we've got our traditional sonar image. On the right-hand side beside it, I've got my down imaging with fish reveal switched on. And then across the full width of the bottom, I've got my side imaging. So this gives me just that full picture of everything that's happening underneath the kayak and out to the side. So this allows me to scan over areas without having to drive over them, but also just gives me that full width of the bottom screen to, uh, to get the most out of that detail. But this particular image here is a, a great representation of a school of fish that isn't too tightly clustered or isn't too tightly packed. Um, and for just from my personal experience, this is the kind of stuff that I really look for when I'm trying to find an active school of fish. To me, this is one of those schools that's you know starting to move around. They're either on, on bait fish or shrimp, um, but they're not so tightly packed that I know they're not spawning. This is really one of those you know perfect schools that I'd be, I'd be confident to get a couple of fish out of when I was if I'm looking for fish this time of year. Right. So I know that's one of the questions that's come up a couple of times is, you know, how do you tell when the fish are active and how do you tell when they're inactive and shut down? So mm. spawning fish pack a little bit closer together and, and closer to the bottom. Is that correct? And the more active fish, they're spread out a bit more. They're up in the water column a bit more. You'll see fish that are moving vertically at times as they can't pick something up or go down to pick something up. Yeah, spot um, on. Spot yeah, on. Okay. But yeah. Um, so you can have a tightly packed school midwater. So even though they look like they're kind of suspended, but a lot of times it's it's that tightly sort of packed factor that I think really gives me the best indication of whether they're active or inactive. I really do want some separation between those fish, those individual arches or blobs or, um, uh, you know, little white rice grains if we're looking at the down imaging. Um, that really gives me an indication that those fish are active and moving up and down through that water column as we're, you know, scanning along. Whereas mm. if, if they're really tightly packed, generally speaking, for me, that's a sign that they're going through their spawning period and they're not really active, I'm not going to true. Yeah, yeah. We had a question come up, Paul, that's kind of relevant to the, the current discussion. And uh, Wayne's asking, with fish reveal on down scan, why still have standard sonar? Uh, it, we've got slightly different, uh, well, we've got dif different frequencies, Wayne. So um, if I'm able to pick up and the the radius or the angle of the beam will be slightly different between my traditional sonar and um, down imaging. So that's the reason why. And the fish reveal just gives me that a little bit of extra um, technology factor, I suppose, of the sounder putting in some of those arches over um, the down scan images that come back. So what would traditionally see as a, as a partial arch or a little blob or a little white rice grain the fish reveal just gives me that little bit extra so I can definitely define what's a bit of bait versus what's an actual fish. Um, and that's the reason why I've got the two side by side. If I'm seeing an arch on my traditional sonar or a partial and I'm seeing a, a fish reveal arch, I'm really confident that what I'm looking at is actually fish and not just bait fish or um, other clutter in the water. No, it's, it's like that multiple lines of evidence thing. You're getting uh, <laughs> different different sonar signals and different sonar returns telling you the exactly. same thing, and it's a pretty good indication that you you know what you're looking at. So Spot I think um, Kevin Beams has also put up a question, which I think is pretty similar. So why do you run so, uh, standard sonar and down scan with fish reveal at the same time? So I think we've answered that. But yeah. Kevin, if we haven't, by all means, you know, put the question up again yeah. or ask it in a different way and we'll come back to it. So. Yeah, or, on to or if I don't answer it properly, just reach out to me afterwards, Kev or Wayne or anyone like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. So um, we've got another question. I'll just put another one up before we go into the next screenshot, mate. So uh, seeing brim on side, sound, side scan or how to set up better on side scan? Biggest thing, so there's not really a great deal that we're doing in terms of side scan other than, so there's some key things. There's transducer placement. Transducer placement's a really critical one. So if we're in the boat, it's ensuring that we've got some really clean water passing over and underneath that transducer, making sure that when we're looking underneath the bottom of the boat, you know, we're getting at least a couple of centimetres of the bottom side of that transducer under the, uh, the, uh, the lowest part of the boat, I guess. So when you're looking at the transom, you really want that transducer just ticking along underneath. And looking ahead, you really don't want any of the strikes or anything in the way of that transducer that might cause a few bubbles 
as the water passes underneath the boat and over that transducer, that's going to have a bit of an impact on the image quality. Then from a settings perspective, you're really talking about only a handful of things that on the side imaging side that we need to play with. So you've got your frequency, so 455 or 800 kilohertz on the Lowrance units. The traditionally speaking, 455 gives you that greater uh, range and coverage and 800 gives you a slightly better image quality. Um, personally speaking, for the for the majority of stuff that I do, I just keep my units in 455. Um, I found that, you know, from what I see, from what I find and where I fish, that works really well for me. Um, generally, I have my range set to about 20 to 25 either side. And for a lot of the systems, such as the Pado, that's enough to cover it edge to edge. Um, even smaller systems, you know, down South Gippsland, I only need to go 10 to 15 aside some days when it's when the tide's really shallow. Um, when I'm up at Malakuta, I'll really push out and maximise and, and limit as far as I can go in terms of getting coverage on the side imaging. But the further we go out, that um, the quality of the image will start to drop off. So I think to get your best image quality, if you if the area that you're fishing is wide enough to handle 25 to 30 aside, I think that's about as far as I would go. I'd stick the unit on 455 kilohertz. And then from a color palette perspective, it's really, really down to the individual, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I'm a huge fan of color palette number six. I think that one works really well for me. It's a good contrast. It allows me to see structure. It allows me to see weed. Um, allows me to really pick up those those fish. And from contrast perspective as well, it, it's really personal preference. I think I'm somewhere around that 80, 82% mark. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, it's probably about it. I think I've covered most of the settings on uh, on side imaging. Yeah, cool. All right, mate, let's move on and put another uh, yeah, a screenshot up. So I know our, our viewers love to see the screenshots. So what are we looking at here, mate? So I've got a couple of, over the years, I've, I've used a number of different units. So this one in particular, Greg, is a Hook 2 unit. So this is one of the uh, one of the units that came out a couple of years ago from the Lawrence in the Lawrence range, and it really is that just plug and play, super simple unit. So this is one of those units where you really don't need to change many settings, but you also don't have the ability to change many. It's really just a plug it in and away you go. So a lot of the sort of smarts are done for you. So once again, just another image interpretation of um, an active school of fish. Uh, this was early winter, a couple of years ago now, um, fishing in the Maribyrnong River. So I've got a couple of yeah, really good fish. We've got some good separation between them. We've got some fish just hugging the bottom and then a couple of others. So we've got fish in 1.6, 1.7, as well as fish all the way up to 1.3. And that, that was just a, a really good example of a unit that, um, you know, I didn't have to do a single thing to. It's straight out of the box. Super simple to use, but a, a really good image of um, an active school of fish that we found a couple of years ago. Sorry, mate, I, I have this nasty habit of muting my microphone and forgetting yeah. to turn it back on again so I can see you <laughs> panicking there. But we've got a question from Bruce Fuller, and, and Bruce is asking, is it best to turn your sonar off when you're using side or structure scan for less interference? Is it best to turn when using... Hey, Bruce, no, absolutely not. Um, don't need to switch that off at all because they um, they run on totally different frequencies. So there's, there's totally no need to switch off your normal sonar, mate. All right. Well, that was a pretty quick and easy answer, mate. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll we'll move on. So let me bring up the next. Uh, we bring up the next one. Perfect. Technology is wonderful. Here we go. There we go. So this is All another right. one from Bem. So this isn't a um, uh, a winter time per se, but um, another good example of um, me drifting along. So what we've got here is. Uh, also another good image to show you guys what I'm looking for or what I what I see when I'm just drifting. So when we're talking about getting good uh, clarity on our side imaging, um, you know, the, the recommendation is really to get the best out of that side imaging view. You really should be moving at about three kilometres an hour, anywhere from two to five will really start to give you a nice clean picture. 
Whereas if we have a look in that top left corner, we've got speed over ground, the SOG. So that's 0.4 of a kilometre per hour. So I was really just barely drifting along. But the, the key thing to look at here is we've got a school of fish underneath me on normal sonar and down imaging, as we talked about before, so I won't touch on that. But on the left-hand side of our side imaging um, screen down the bottom, you guys can see that we've got some black spots. So right down the middle, we've got obviously our, um, our center line where the kayak is. We've got the, uh, the dark black, which is the water column beneath me. And then out to the sides, we've got some little white dots, some little white rice grains. And then to the left of those, we've got those dark black shadows. So those are actually fish that are suspended off the bottom and they're throwing the shadows. So the easiest way for, for new people who are unfamiliar with side imaging technology, it's essentially just like shining a uh, flashlight onto an object and then it throws a shadow behind it. So if you want to think of it that way. So what we've actually got is as we're drifting along, there's a school of fish just to the left of me in that 10 to 15 sort of meter range to the left of the kayak as well as some a lot closer in that about six to seven as well. So we can see some of those white dots that are a little bit closer to that sort of seven meter mark off to the left side of the kayak. So it allows me to do two things as well. It allows me to, you know, using the touchscreen technology, just put my finger or a cursor onto one of those dots and hit the uh, new waypoint key, but also just allows me to quickly grab a rod and make a little cast out to the left hand side of the kayak and just slowly twitch and hop a little lure or a grub or a, a vibe and fish that school actively because I know the fish are right there as we're drifting along. Yeah, good stuff, mate. Now, we've got a whole swathe of questions coming through here. So um, I'm going to bring a couple of them up that are quite similar. Sure. Um, so we've got Dale Baxter. G'day, Dale. Uh, Dale. Nice to have you Hi, here. Mate. So, yeah, good to see you, mate. What's the best frequency to use in the shallow systems, as in less than five metres deep? And before you answer that one, mate, I'll bring up um, Shane Ling's question as well, because they're pretty similar. So when you fish really shallow water, do you turn the sonar off so the ping doesn't spook fish? So a couple of shallow water questions there, mate. What's the best frequency? And do you turn the sonar off to avoid spooking the fish? Perfect. Um, so I'll start with DB. So hey, Dale. Um, as you know, a lot of the places that we fish are generally less than five, mate. Um, and personally for me, um, I, I really, I haven't switched my unit off of 455 kilohertz for quite a long time on the side imaging. So for me personally, uh, 455 on side imaging and down. And then on our traditional sonar, I'm just running 200 kilohertz um, for our traditional sonar frequency. But the other thing I wanted to call out, I forgot to mention at the start, um, a lot of our units have a, a fishing mode. So within that fishing mode, just make sure that your sounder is set to shallow water. So shallow water really just allows the unit to, to identify and know how deep you're generally fishing. Um, it also just allows the unit to pick up some of those changes in depth a lot easier. So, you know, as you're going in and out of really shallow water, the unit really handles it quite well. Um, and the other two things that I wanted to call out is ensure that your ping speed is set to max and your scroll speed is set to normal. So that's going to give you a nice, really clean, good image out of your traditional sonar, out of your down imaging and your side imaging. And um, to Shane's question, do I, Shane, I don't really do it unless I'm fishing in a comp and unless I'm sitting on a school. So there have been times where, especially if there's a couple of other boats around us, that will be the only times that I'll ever switch my sonar off or my unit off or at least stop so hit the stop sonar button. If I'm social fishing, I, I won't do it. If I'm in a comp and I'm sitting on a school, that's quite, quite big but still allows me to move around, you know, in a, let's say the size of a footy field or a swimming pool. And I know I'm just kind of going from spot to spot within the school. I'll probably switch my sander off if I'm pretty confident I'm getting a few fish. Uh, if I still want to have that ability to mark a couple of spots, you know, look down at my map, see where I'm at, I might keep it running for a little bit longer. Um, I really just play it by ear. If there's a couple of other boats around me, and I know they're running sounders as well. You start to get a bit of interference. You start to get a fair bit more ping. Um, and those will be the times that I'll switch my sounder off. Good stuff, Paul. All right. So look, a couple more questions coming through. We might just continue to work our way through some of those before we move on to the, um, on to the next screenshot. So uh, 
We've got Mark Bins. G'day, Binsy, uh, another ALF listener. Good to have you here, mate. So um, is there a maximum depth where side scan becomes ineffective? So in Middle Harbour, Sydney, where Mark fishes, he gets as deep as 25 metres. I'm going to read the rest of the question because it doesn't appear on the screen. Did Brim hang out that deep? He continues on. Hey, Mark. Um, so personally speaking, I haven't personally fished for Brim that deep. I know guy, I've got a few, uh, quite a few friends, especially you know, through the power of uh, social media and Facebook. Um, I've got quite a few friends up in Sydney who do that deep water blading thing in the harbour for Brim. Um, I haven't heard them going any more than sort of 10 to 12 to 14 effectively. So I know that they do go down to those depths. 25s, I, I personally don't think so. Or it's not a, a depth that I would feel comfortable at. I'm more of a structure guy. Um, I like to be up in less than five metres personally for the majority of my brim fishing as it's it also kind of lines up with some of the lakes and rivers and estuaries that we get down here in Victoria predominantly. In terms of side scan and its effectiveness, it absolutely is. But the key thing that you need to be mindful of there is the deeper you are, the bigger your range needs to be to accommodate for that. So if we think back to the screenshot that Greg had up previously with my quite thin black line in the middle and my... Um, that's my water column beneath me. So I'm only in 2.3, 2.4 metres there. So if you think you're in 25, that's going to pretty much, that black space is going to shift right out to the sides and pretty much take up that entire screen. So what you need to do is you need to bump out your range out to like 40 or 50 to then accommodate for that deep water in the middle, which is your water column beneath the, beneath the boat or kayak either side, and then to allow it to then hit the bottom and then shoot out to the sides to uh to start get it, getting some of that reading off the bottom either side of the boat or kayak so increase your range the deeper you go hopefully that answers your question there mark so um paul sarah ramsey's posted a question but it comes in two parts once again so let me read it to you so sure. sarah says i've heard you talk about the advantages of using side scan in shallow water as you don't have to uh, don't have to go over the fish to show you know to show them on the sound and you're not going to spook them so is uh, in this case, do you run side scan on full stream to help to see the detail better? Or full screen, I should say. No, hey Sarah, um, I personally don't. I think it just, and this is in, in no way uh, to be taken out of context, I guess, but it all just comes down to experience and kind of what you're looking at. So for me personally, um, I'll either be able to pick up a little dot or rice grain or a little line and be pretty confident um, that what I'm looking at is a fish. Um, absolutely, you can run it on full screen. Um, the way that I've got my split screen set up is it's essentially the bottom half of my sounder is essentially full screen for where am I? Uh, here we are. Um, the bottom of half of my sounder is essentially full screen width anyway for side imaging. And then um, if I was to do the, the entire screen on side imaging, it would give me a little bit more detail. But um, I think at this point, I'm, I'm pretty confident in what I'm seeing. And there's only really a couple of things that I look for, um, one of which is digs. So we've got a great screenshot. Um, maybe if we can bring that up next, Greg, is, you know, really I'm looking for fish on that side imaging, looking for those little white dots, white rice grains and shadows. So shadows are really quite important, especially when, uh, as per that screenshot we had a little while back, when I'm not actively moving. If I'm just drifting and I start to see some black shapes, out to the sides, I know that there's active fish that are moving in and around either to the left or right of me. So I'm casting out to those shadows regardless. Um, and the other one is that we're gonna show you guys is some digs. So a lot of time, and we'll, we'll show you what digs look like on the sound or on the side imaging. A lot of let times- me just, um, Let me just scroll through them, mate, and, and tell me which perfect. slide it is that you want up there and we can uh, we can stop at that one. Keep going, keep going, keep going. That's the one. One back. One back? Yep. That's it. So what we've got here on the right hand side of that kite of the side imaging screen. So if at the about the ten to fifteen meter mark is we're looking at um some digs here. This is probably somewhere like Malakuta. A lot of the Gippsland systems, um, a lot of the fish are really digging up worm and crab. Um, and this is what I really look for. Um, quite often you'll find in systems like Malakuta, 
you'll go over these digs and there's nothing in them, but you'll come back or you'll fish the area a little bit further ahead um, and you'll have some really, really nice fish still sitting in that deep water. Um, so quite often, again, I mark these areas that I know fish have been actively feeding. They're, you know, feeding zones, so to speak. A lot of times this feeding happens at night, but the fish are never too far away. So I always look for digs. I always look for those little white rice grains or those shadows to indicate that there's fish either side of me. Um, I'll mark them, you know, appropriately on the, on the side imaging and then sort of refer back to them on my mapping unit. And we've got another screenshot somewhere. Uh, a bit further along, I think, Greg, of kind of how I utilise that mapping screen uh, a bit Just further so down, I think. I think it might be towards the outset. So we'll go one back. So that top left-hand corner, guys, is is a, a tournament weekend, uh, but it's a really good indication and it's similar to how I sort of approach my, shell, my um, social fishing as well as my tournament fishing is using a lot of the predefined sort of icons that you can use to mark um, different, I guess, different points of structure, different points of interest. So whether they're digs, whether there's fish that I've marked, fish that I've caught, the size of the fish, and then I'll also mark them on different days in different colours. So this to me indicates, you know, on the Saturday of the tournament, uh, fish, were marked, uh, fish were biting in the green zone, whereas on the Sunday I could only get them in the red zone, for example. So it's, it's the way that I structure my uh, uh, weight points and the way that I go about methodically, I guess, finding an area and finding some sort of pattern as well within that area um, to, again, really start to concentrate and spend the most time on productive areas of the lake or productive depths. So whether they're in, you know, 2.5, but no deeper than 3.2. And that's what I'll focus on for the rest of the tournament to really maximise that fishing time and um, focus key in on those fish that are biting. So you still, you still might be able to find fish out in those deeper waters in 3, 3.5, 4, but I find that a lot of the fish really have a very specific depth or temperature range that they're happy to eat in, and then the other fish are still doing their spawn thing or not quite ready. They're in a staging pattern or they're ready to move up, but they're not quite ready to eat. So it's something to be mindful of. Don't sit on those schools for too long. Move away and find those schools that are active. Mark them in a certain way, and then focus on those as you are. Uh, as you go throughout the day. Excellent stuff. Now, Paul, we had a couple of questions that were submitted in advance, so we might go through those if you like. So sounds good. Let's bring up this one from Nikki Bryant. So uh, Nikki's asking, and Nikki incidentally has been a guest on the podcast, as has her husband, as has her son on multiple occasions. Yeah. So they're a real fishing family over there in Western Australia. Not sure if Nikki will be tuning in uh, because uh, Nick, uh, Nikki's Nikki's down in Victoria actually. Um, oh, she's down in Victoria. Is she she's down in Victoria. Yeah, still, yeah it's a lovely fishing family. Um, yeah, I've had, yeah. had the pleasure of chatting to the guys a number of times, so I know them well. Okay, I'm getting my wires crossed. Out, so that's all right. <laughs> very very good. So um, Nikki's asking, can we distinguish brim from other species on our sounder screen? So let's bring up a couple that uh, that we had lined up. And by the way, guys, for anyone who's looking at that thinking they're mull away, they weren't. They were just brim. But um, we're just drifting very slowly over those. Uh, that's it, Greg. Yep, one back, please. One more. Perfect. Thank you. So this is this is one of two screenshots um, out of the Patterson River. Um, and so on the down imaging is probably the better one. The, the traditional sonar um, up the top right, uh, the fish are quite, got some separation between the fish. Uh, but we're not quite getting that uh, indication of size, whereas I think the, the down imaging screens are really good um, indication of size. We've got some smaller brim, and then just towards the bottom there, we're starting to see a couple of really big arches. And then if we go to the next one again, please, Greg, going forwards or down. Yep, yeah, that's it. So towards the right-hand side of our traditional sonar and even on down imaging, we can see that we've just got a small patch of brim um, again, we've got some separation. They're a bit more tightly packed than the previous school, uh, previous screenshot. But then again, we've just got that really clear image of we've got a nice big arch. It's got some real size to it. It's a nice big blob and some real solid color. And then on that down imaging, it's hard to miss. Like we've got a real solid fish there in comparison to some of those brim. So to me, this is the kind of thing that I look for when I'm 
you know, chasing jewies in the Yarra or chasing jewies in the Patterson River. Um, this is the kind of stuff that I look for. But at the same time, if I'm fishing for brim and I see this, generally it might even uh, turn those brim off a little bit from uh, from chewing as they might turn into uh, fish food. <laughs> Very good. All right, mate. Let me just come back and talk to you for a moment. We, um, we've got a few more questions popping up. So, guys, keep them coming. We're happy to keep going through them. If we don't answer them straight away, that's because there's a pile of them starting to build up. Uh, if we don't get to them, feel free to put them up again, and hopefully we'll get through all of them before the night's out. Or as Paul says, you know, once the live stream's over, uh, you can always put a comment up on his Facebook or on my Facebook, and we'll get back to you with an answer. So the other thing I should mention is that this uh, live stream also goes out to YouTube, and it gets uh, archived. This fly's annoying. It gets archived with um, timestamps on it. So you can actually go back through the video and just choose those bits that you want to watch. You don't have to watch the whole thing again to get the answers to the particular questions that you want. So I'll, uh, I'll put a link to the YouTube in the description for this um, post a bit later on. So Paul, um, we've got um, Paddy Bud who's um, saying he's got a Hook 7 TS. Uh, does he need to make adjustments at all or just leave it? Mainly fishes shallow water four to seven metres and offshore sometimes 25 to 35 metres. Hey, Paddy. Um, look, on the triple shot, um, there's really not a lot that you need to do, mate. Um, now, I haven't played around with a triple shot for a number of years now. So the only thing I want to do is just double check for you. Maybe we can come back to that one. Yeah. Um, Perhaps we can get back to Paddy with a personal message. If anyone else has got a got a question, we can we can do that. You know, just let us know and we can give you the yeah. same answer but yeah um, rather than try and try and google things as we're going but yeah yeah no so the only the only thing there patty is in the four to seven mate absolutely leave it um as it is out of the box um there's absolutely nothing that you need to do in terms of any setting changes i think they they're an absolutely great unit um for that less than 10 meter uh depth um and then maybe a, i'll um i'll reach out to you about the 25 to 35 sort of range um, and we can see what we can do there. But generally speaking, they are just a plug and play unit. You know, that's kind of the the, the big kicker with them is um, there's not a lot that needs to be done in terms of settings. The unit does the majority of the work for you. Excellent stuff. All right. Um, now, Paul Langley's asking, uh, and again, this one won't come up fully on the screen, but there's a whisper that there's something big coming from Lawrence to improve their live site in the coming months. Do you think this but will improve the impact on the brim scene? Uh, hey Paul, um, look, it's it's something that the guys are obviously working on. I haven't heard anything around the, in the coming months. Um, I think we're still a little while away, but um, we haven't got great visibility of that to be 100% truthful. Um, it's something that I'm quite excited about personally, but having seen some of the competition and some of the other, I guess, some of the other brands and the way that some of their life site functionality kind of works, I definitely think I'll see it as an advantage around structure. Um, in some of those open systems like Malakuta, where I fish, or Gippsland Lakes, um, even Nelson, so we've got some great rock, uh, some great river systems with some fantastic structure. But personally speaking, I think that life site sort of functionality um, is really more geared towards um, really, really big pieces of structure. So we're looking at trees, you know, places like up north where the guys are chasing Barramundi or Sooty Grunter. And you're really going from, or bass, bass, I mean, is a perfect example as well, um, as well as um, yellow belly at Windermere and places like that. I think those are probably the better applications for that life site functionality. I think for brim, I'll, I'm still able to, to um, you know, pedal along in my kayak, um, idle along in the boat and still use my site imaging to pick up fish under pontoons. I don't need a life site unit to uh, sort of point it at the pontoon and see if there's anything there, see how they're moving around. It's it's great, but I don't think it's going to be critical and I don't think it's going to change um, tournament fishing, especially for brim in a lot of the places that we fish personally. I think side imaging and traditional sonar has really got that covered. That's my sort of personal opinion on it. But um, as soon as it's out, don't worry, I'll be, I'll be getting it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there, you go. there you go mate so uh that answers your question so shane neighbor is asking uh i have a hook too and when i move into one meter of water the screen freezes until i get back into deeper water i usually run down scan and side scan does this happen to your unit 
Uh, hey, Shane. No, it wasn't anything that I ever experienced with my Hook 2. So just a, a quick call out. I've been running the Elite TI 2 for probably the last 12 to 18 months now. And I ran the Hook 2 for about 12 months back in 2018 to the start of 2019. Uh, but never had an issue, Shane. I would reach out to the Navico team. I think it's 1300 Navico. Um, you get through to the guys over in Sydney or in New Zealand and they'll take care of you and, and let you know what you need to do with it if it's having any software issues, mate. But um, yeah, they'll get you squared away. All right. So Shane Ling, what speed do you travel when you get those digs showing on your sounder, mate? Hey, Lingy, just um, again, in that two to five kilometres an hour range, I think three to to four is probably ideal speed for side imaging, but it all comes down to your hull. So from memory, you've got the bass boat, mate. Um, I'm tipping it's transom mounted or mounted to the bottom of the hull. Um, I really do think that three to five kilometres an hour is probably the ideal speed for side imaging to get the dicks to show. All right, mate. Now, this next question, I think, might relate to some of the um, slides that we got coming up. So I'll bring it up and we can um, switch over to the uh, to the slide deck again. Perfect. Hey, Wayno. Does the Billy Pro Guard interfere with the signal at all? Not at all, buddy. So all these images that you guys are seeing are all taken with a Billy Pro transducer shield over my uh, transducer. So right, let me just let me just go back and perhaps for those who aren't familiar with the uh, with the Billy Pro Guard, mate, you might like to uh, give us a bit of a rundown on it. Yeah, that's right. So the um, the Billy Pro Guard or Billy Pro transducer shield is a, um, a really hard perspex cover that goes over the top of your transducer and that is a, a, attached to the bottom of the Hobie kayak. So it's, a lot of the newer Hobies have a, um, a Guardian system which essentially retracts the transducer and protects it in a way as well. But um, this just allows you to have this transducer shield over the top of the transducer at all times. Um, so you know that your transducer has been protected but the thickness of that transducer shield still allows the signal to pass through without any issues whatsoever. Um, Marty's done some great things to the design. You can see some little holes there. So if you're beach launching or you're getting into the shallows, you can get a bit of sand built up. But as you travel along, um, that water pushes through that transducer shield and just washes all that sand back out so you never have any issues. Still open it up from time to time, every six to 12 months and see if there's any debris in there. Give it a little clean out if you need to, but generally speaking, you don't need to. Um, it's a great little investment in uh, protecting your transducer, uh, but also getting those fantastic readings at all times without having to hang like a bracket off the back of the kayak, having to flip it up manually. It's just there at all times, but you know it's protected. So it's a great little uh, aftermarket accessory. All right, moving on to the next question. So Steve Peach, thanks for your question, mate. So Paul, do you have any success picking out brim on bank side structure using side scan? Hey, Steve. Um, I do, mate. I Look, the, the big one here is the, the type of bank side structure that I look for. Again, I'll use examples such as Mallacoota, um, Gippsland Lakes, uh, Nelson, or Warnable. So those four systems that I talk about, they're generally speaking quite heavily lined with quite big boulders and rocks on the sides. And again, so what I'm looking for there is in amongst those rocks, I'm looking for those little white rice grains, those little white dots. And that's the type of thing that I look for. So generally speaking, Dad and I, if we're in a, in a tournament event, um, uh, we will you know, side scan a, a rocky structure. We'll go along for 100, 150 metres. Generally speaking, if, if, that, if those rocks or that section of bank is holding fish, you'll start to see a, a bit of a pattern. Um, we might not mark individual fish but we know that that particular stretch of rocks is holding fish and all it takes is you know two three four um, little dots for me to be confident that that rocky structure is holding fish the other key thing with it is it really depends on how those fish are positioning on the rocks or at the bottom of those rocks and that will really determine what the signal looks like or that the image interpretation back on the screen a lot of times um, the fish will sit between rocks so if there's a a crevice say so wide between two boulders and that brim sitting right in the middle of the two waiting for something to come through and ambush it well that signal is not going to be able to pick up that fish because there's a boulder in the way um, so you, you do have to make some I guess adjustments mentally that looking at the side imaging screen I can see what the structure of the bottom looks like I can see it's quite reefy there's lots of rocks 
I can see a couple of fish, and I'm going to assume that there's a couple more that I've missed because of the way that the rocks is, are some kind of uh, positioned underwater. And there's probably some extra fish there that I can't see because they're just sitting out of the way behind those rocks. Thanks for that, Paul. So I'm going to bring up a question that was submitted earlier in the week, and it was from Ben Gibbs. So, Paul, what's the best way to convince shutdown schools of rim to bite? Uh, what are the best techniques, lures, uh, you know, size and, and type? Or, would, you know, if they're shut down, do you just give up and move on, mate? Yeah. Hey, Gibbsy. So awesome question, mate. Thank you for submitting that in. I'm going to refer to a, a little um, one-pager that I put together for this one in particular. Um, and I'll talk to you guys, I guess, you know, as Greg said earlier, this video is about sonar, but also about trying to maximise um, our ability to catch bream in winter, especially down here in Victoria or South Australia. Um I mean, our climates are very similar. Our systems are very similar. So uh, for me personally, winter time for brim, there's only a small handful of lures that I will use. So the three key, the three key lure types will be small soft plastics, small stick minnows, and small vibes. From there, within the soft plastic range, I'm in the two to 2.75 inch size. So quite small. And from a colour perspective, I keep it very simple this time of year. Motor oil, pumpkin seed, um, and olive. You know, really those greens, browns, and our UV colours. I mean, blacks as well, but I'm personally not a huge fan of blacks, so I stick to the other three. For me, for me personally, this time of year, our waters are a little bit more discoloured. So those three lure colours that I spoke about really have a great silhouette this time of year. They really stand out underwater. Uh, we also, during the week, we've been talking about painting jig heads. So getting some of that powder paint, you know, the temped powder paint, painting some of the jig heads using some of the UV powders. Um, orange, it's a fantastic color in really dirty water. Uh, we've also got, well, obviously, all the motor oils. So this just gives a little bit of extra shine, a little bit of extra glow to your lure, whether it's a soft plastic, um, or even, you know, you're able to make some other modifications to other types of lures. You're able to dunk a little bit of the um, the bladed lures into some of that powder paint and set it as well, just for a bit of extra glow. So from a, you know, a technique perspective, it's really, I start out with my soft plastics. I start out with that 2.5 inch grub or 2.75 inch um, slim swim. If I'm not having any luck, I'll go down to a two inch grub just to see if I can finesse them. The next thing that I'll switch on over to will be a stick minnow. I only fish stick minnows when the water's relatively clear. I think the subtle action of a stick minnow in winter time can be fantastic for those fish that are slightly suspended, slightly, not the ones that we're talking mid-water that aren't doing anything. Those fish that are still relatively active, but the water's clear, they can see that little flutter on the way down. When it's super dirty, I personally don't bother with a stick minnow. I stick to my plastics and I stick to vibles. So moving into vibes, 35 mil size, I think is probably the perfect size come winter time, especially for us Victorians. Something like the EcoGear VX35 or EcoGear ZX35. So the key difference there is we've got the VX with the two sets of trebles and the ZX35 with the stinger hooks. So the stinger hooks are obviously fantastic for those fish that are just picking at it. They're trying to just grab the feelers off that little uh, ZX, which looks like a little prawn. It's also got that real nice wide wobble. So I generally just rotate between the two of those. And on the vibe side of things, I um, I really like the blacks and the greys. So you like that color 339 in the Eco Gear range or 443 from memory, it's just the, the black. Um, and in terms of like time spent on a particular school, Benny, I, I generally give it, if it's a school that's quite sizable and I can move within it, um, I give it 20 to 30 minutes. I'll give 10 minutes on the plastics, maybe five on the stick minnow if it's clear, and then another 10 to 15 on the vibe, and then maybe come back and do, you know, a, a, the two inch grub again for a couple of casts just to see if I can um, get those fish to eat. The other thing that I haven't talked about, but I think it's quite important in winter time, we've got really varying sizes of schools. So we've got schools that are quite compact that are only the size of this room, for example, and then we've got schools that can stretch for the size of a footy field. The, the key thing with those schools is picking the edges of those schools. A lot of times those fish that are smack bang in the middle of those schools are really quite inactive. A lot of the fish that have finished their spawn or are actually 
quite interested in what's happening. Um, they're the more feeding active fish. They hang around the outside. So it's quite important to identify where the school starts, where the school ends, especially if that coincides with a like a structure change. So if I've got a turn in the river, if I've got a rocky point, if I've got a jetty that kind of coincides with the end of a school, that's where I'm going to focus my time. I'm going to focus on those outer edges of the school as I think that's where the bigger fish and the more active fish will be. Uh, but generally, if I'm not getting any hits whatsoever after 20 to 30 minutes, I'm out of there. I'm finding that next piece. Yeah, mate, I've just put up a question as well from Warwick Holmes, which uh, was very, very similar. But he finishes with, and you probably answered this as well, but he finishes with, with a slightly different question. That is, how far would you normally move off if you're only in an active school, you can't tempt them, you decide you're going to move on. How far would you normally move off to find a new school? Hey, Warwick, it, it's a bit of a tricky question to answer, but look, let's use Malakuta as an example. So if we're in the bottom lake and I've got fish that I've marked in, in two and a half metres and I'm just not getting them to eat at all, um, I will generally fish within, say, two to three kilometres of that area because it's such a vast system. And, I mean, with bass boat technology or, or most tinnies, you're eight you're able to move around quite freely. As, as per the previous question with Benny, I'll give it 20 to 30 on a particular spot, especially in a tournament where you've got two anglers on a boat. You can really vary your techniques, your lure selection, your uh, retrieves. If you're not getting hits between the two of you, I would move. I wouldn't, I wouldn't move 500 metres. I'd move a bit further. I still think that a lot of times you need to get away from that school, you need to get into a new zone. I will go you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a metre shallower, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a metre deeper. I'll go to a point. I'll go to a rock wall. I'll try something different until I find that pattern. If I know that out on that mud, I'm not getting those fish to fire up, I'll move to a, a part that's got a bit of wind blowing onto the bank or in that particular area. Even though, you know, you're, you're in one river system or one lake system, um, the top lake at Malakuta could be blowing 15 knots and the bottom lake still hasn't got any wind on it or vice versa. So it's thinking about the forecast, thinking about the types of structure that's in the area within five to 10 minutes of me. Um, so it's maximizing your fishing time. So you don't want to travel for half an hour if you can avoid it. But I generally try and get away from that school. I'm not going to move 100 meters. I'm not going to move 200 meters. I'm going to try and find something completely different but um, learn from, from what I did, you know, take that on board, go, well, those fish out on the mud, they were sitting there in two and a half, they were pretty close to the bottom, or they were mid water. That's not what I'm gonna look for right now. I'm gonna find something that's quite different to that and see if this next patch of fish will eat. And then if they do, that's what I wanna try and replicate as I move around from spot to spot and uh, keep going throughout the day. Good stuff. Mate, that was a masterclass. So I, I've been jotting down notes here and um, <laughs> I'm going to go back to us. We've got the recording so we can go back to YouTube or back to Facebook and watch it again. So thank you for that. So um, going back now to uh, Sounders, Paul. So uh, Nick is asking for some recommendations in terms of batteries for running uh, units. I'm, I guess he's talking about on kayaks. You're predominantly, predominantly a kayak fisherman. Um, yeah, I, I am. I mean, Nick, um, in the kayak, mate, I'm running the FPV 17.5 amp hour lithiums. Um, I'll have to get back to you on what we're running out of the boat, and it's not one that I, I remember off the top of my head. Um, uh, I think we're roughly in that 100 amp hour range on the boat for the HDS 12 Live, but for the Elite TI 2 on my Hobie, I'm running the 17.5 hour um, lithium from FPV power, and that's been, been a really good battery to me so far. Um, when I do upgrade the kayak, I am toying with the idea of going to a 12 inch unit um, with the 3D uh, transducer and module. So I may need to go up and bump that up to about a 30 amp hour, 36 sort of amp hour-ish um, to get a full day to two days um, out of the larger screen and the 3D module as well. So that's something that I'm toying with on the 360 uh, Hobie. Awesome. So um, Wayne's asking, or has made a comment, I guess, that uh, he's just fitted his TI-2 with 3-in-1, had to fit the guard to the transducer on the PA-17. Now, that, to me, sounds like French. I'm hoping it means something to you, Paul. Um, I had to fit the guard to fit the transducer. 
I'm not, no, I'm not entirely sure what Wayne is asking in that last section. Apologies, Wayne. So you, you've got the PA17, Wayne. you've got the 3 in 1 active imaging transducer on the bottom. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what fit in the guard, what you're referring to there, um, if you're talking about that belly pro transducer shield or whether you're talking about having to modify something, not, not too sure. So maybe just Wayne, uh, for, reach out for to us. Another, for us another question, mate, see if you can clarify or otherwise we can get in touch with you afterwards. And yeah, Paul, I'm sure Paul will be able to help you out. So uh, a fairly lengthy one here from Steve Morris. So I'll read the full thing out to you. but uh, <laughs> I can answer it already. I already know this one. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you know you know the guest and you know the question. Oh, I know, right? Yeah, I know Steve. Steve Look, for, for the benefit of those that, that don't know the question, it's really about how to effectively manage waypoints and you know the fact that you can put a lot of waypoints into a uh, into a unit over the course of a, a comp. And you know, do you leave them there for the next comp or do you delete them or you know how do you tell old ones from new ones quickly and that kind of stuff. So, give us a few of your pro tips there, Paul, for managing those <laughs> waypoints before they get out of hand. So I, I know a few, a few, a few of you will probably scoff at this, um, but while I'm still relatively young, my memory is still pretty good. So <laughs> I, I actually, I generally either wipe them completely, um, or given you know life changes, you have a little one come along, you don't get the opportunity to fish as often. Uh, a lot of times I'm back to the same system 12, 18 months later. Um, a lot of times I've either you know had a new unit put on the kayak or the boat. Um, trying something different out or I've reset it. Um, so a lot of times I'm just starting completely from scratch again. Um, I think that's probably the best way. It What it allows me to do is it doesn't give me any preconceived ideas. Um, it allows me to think um, to that particular weekend, to the weather, to the time of year. Um, it allows me to you know look at the water clarity, look at the water temperatures and formulate a plan and to start scratch, uh, start from scratch. Um, at the end of a weekend, there's you know there's absolutely no issues putting in two, three hundred waypoints um, over the course of three days, and then really it's just putting that in the memory bank. Um, I really should keep a diary, but I don't. Uh, but personally speaking, yeah, everything tends to just go in the memory bank for now. It's pretty good. I've got some uh, some great opportunities to take photos, have some memories, obviously on the phone, through Facebook, through a couple of other ways through the, the vlogs that, that I'm now doing as well. So I, I get to document those things. Um, but for me, as I said, I categorize my waypoints over the course of a weekend just by color coding through either size, colors, days of the comp. And then from there, I'll, I'll just forget about it. It's really come to the next event at the same location and with a fresh mindset, start from scratch. Oh, I think we got you on mute. I'm glad your yeah. memory is good, Paul. I, I don't think my memory was that good even when I was younger. So <laughs> I, I'm impressed that you can manage all of that. So, uh, Paul, question from um, Benjamin Hodgkins. So uh, does running the down scan overlay on traditional sonar add any benefits? Uh, hey, Benny. No, mate. For me personally, I never run the down scan overlay over traditional sonar. For me, the, the image just gets a little bit too uh, complicated. I'm trying to see too much there. I think with even a seven inch unit, you've got enough uh, screen real estate to run split screens of your traditional sonar and down imaging side by side, as well as the uh, side imaging along the bottom. I think from a screen real estate and usage of that space, that's probably the best way to split your screen. And I personally don't see any um, benefit to overlaying the down scan over traditional sonar. Alrighty. So one here from Lee Waddington. So he's got a hook to seven triple shot in his kayak. Uh, are there any particular setting preferences that you have when facing different water conditions? So for example, differences in water clarity, concentration of debris, how do you filter these externals out to better identify the fish? Hey Lee, so predominantly, even on my, like as we talked about uh, the hook two, the hook two is really that really simple unit um, the unit does everything for the angler, essentially. It's a plug and play unit, but even looking at my, you know, I've used the HDS units, I've used the carbons, the lives, the elite, elite TI2s. Um, I, I generally run my units on auto for most parts these days. Uh, the key thing that I do have them on is auto plus four or plus five on my sensitivity. 
What I find with auto sensitivity, I think the units really handle the changes in water clarity and water temperatures really well. I think perhaps, you know, five, ten years ago, some of those auto settings really backed off some of that sensitivity, gave you a nice clean screen. But what you were missing as an angler was a lot of those arches, a lot of those partial arches, a lot of those blobs that are fish that the unit was um, not really picking up and thinking that it was clutter on the uh, on the screen. But these days, I think the auto sensitivity on the units is absolutely fantastic. Um, as I said, I bumped mine up by a couple of uh, percent. And the reason for that is I prefer to put up with a bit of additional clutter on the screen, but it allows me to pick up those additional partial arches that a lot of people miss out on. So it's those little one percenters, as we say, um, that will allow you to find those fish that a lot of other people will miss out on. Um, from a from some of the other settings perspective, I guess, especially with the, the hook too, there's really not much more there. From memory, you can play around with the contrast, which is really just how, how light or how dark um, the image is on the side imaging and down imaging. And for me personally, I think mine was sitting somewhere around that 76 to 82% mark. And that's just what I'm comfortable with in terms of the returns that I get. Um, I don't want to wash anything out, so I don't want to go above 82% and I don't want it to be too dark. So I'm kind of sitting there somewhere. Um, but as I said, even going from a clear clear system such as Melacuda coming back to Melbourne, I think that auto plus a couple of percent works really well for me. I think we've got you on mute again, Greg. Yeah, I mean, this time it wasn't my fault. This time I was actually <laughs> pressing the button and it wouldn't turn off. Sorry about that, guys. I've actually no. got a um, got a bit of a throat bug, so I keep turning it off because I'm coughing and, uh, <laughs> and 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 gasping. So I don't don't want you to have to listen to that. But um, anyway, so Paul, like uh, Carl uh, states, asking us, is the scale on the side image a true representation of how far the fish are from you? Great question, Carl. I love, love it. Absolutely. Hey, Carl, from, from my experience, from what I found, it's been a really, really accurate representation of how far they are. Um, there was one particular example at Malacuta in 2018, so around this time, uh, two years ago. So Dad and I hadn't fished an event for quite a while together. You know, we're having a good day, bottom lake of Malacuta. We had our five. We were just side scanning a bank. For, that's a bank that we rarely fish as well. Found a patch of three to four active fish on side imaging. You know, they were 20 metres to the right-hand side. I literally didn't even have the electric motor down yet. Pinged out a cast 20 metres to the side, or 25 metres, 30 metres. So trying to cast past that school. I was in about four and a half to five metres, two-inch grub on a one-sixth jig head. It sunk down to the bottom, two twitches, clunk. So I was right there. You know, that, that, that image really was true, um, and the scale really showed me how far that fish was away from uh, from where we were. I think it ended up taking big brim and obviously helped us secure a really good bag and a win. But um, yeah, re literally, you know, side scanning going, oh, there's fish getting up, bang, quick cast. And uh, five seconds later, we're hooked up. So it was incredible. But from what I found, yeah, super accurate, mate. Excellent stuff. Now, Warren's asking, he's saying he's really late. Is there anywhere he can get this podcast from the start? Yeah, there is, mate. Don't worry. It will be available. So what happens at the end of the live stream is it'll Facebook will tell you there's a problem. There's actually not a problem. It's just Facebook processing a whole hour of live stream, and then it'll come back and put the replay on whichever Facebook page you happen to be watching this from. Or you can go over to fishingqna.com forward slash sonar, and you'll find a replay there with some timestamps. Or you can go to YouTube, so doclures.com. Uh, YouTube and you'll find that there's a replay there with timestamps as well. So you haven't missed anything. And I noticed that you've also asked the question. So I'll bring that question up now. So you've uh, you've taken the, made the most of the opportunity, Wayne. So uh, Warren, sorry. So uh, good stuff. So Paul, what's the heaviest braid and leader combo that you would use for winter brim fishing? Hey, Warren. So generally speaking, I won't go any lighter than four pound leaders. From what I found, unless the water's like crystal crystal clear up north around foster or some of those other systems in victoria there's really no need at this time of year to run your two and a half your threes if you're not getting fish on four I'd, for the most part i'd move on um 
generally speaking, if the water's quite dirty and I'm fishing around structure, I will run six pound leaders, um, six pound uni teaker. I found that that's the best uh, fluorocarbon leader in terms of its diameter compared to its breaking strain. So I found that a lot of other six pound leaders are quite uh, thick in comparison to the uni teaker. So I think that's a great um, leader choice. And in terms of braid, I haven't, I'm haven't. i not running anything lighter than 10 pound braid on all my brim outfits, even the lightest brim outfits in the Grub Freaks and 2004 size um, reels. So I've got quite finesse, you know, exist reels, but I'm running 10 pound all the way up to 16 pound. And the reason for that is the diameter on braid and the uh, technology with braid is just so amazing these days. Everything's so thin. We've got these eight strand, 12 strand braids that are just super supple, super round. Um, you know, you can just cast them an absolute mile, but it also just allows me to then pick up one of those rods, pick up one of my heavier brim rods and go snapper fishing with it or go mull away fishing. So it still allows me to do my whole brim thing, still allows me to tie great knots, but then has the flexibility to go and chase other stuff. So um, that's kind of my setups. Very good. So uh, Luke Turner is asking, he's got an Elite 9 Ti2, and he's asking, can we talk about installing updates on the unit? So SD size, uh, card size needed, and the process of updating. And there's a couple of comments have come up. I won't bring them up on the screen, but a couple of people, Nikki's one, have said 32 gigabytes is the size to get for SD cards. Yep. Um, yeah, in, in terms of the update process, uh, we probably don't want to get too technical here, mate, but it, can you direct um, Luke to the, the appropriate place to... Yeah. to find that information? Yeah, so I'll, I'll quickly touch on it. Um, as Nikki and some of the other guys said, um, please don't get an S micro SD card bigger than 32 gig. If you can get your hands on a 16 or a 32, those two will be perfect. There's two ways that you can update your uh, Elite Ti2, Luke. You can connect it to Wi-Fi or hotspot off your mobile phone. So you can connect your mobile phone through the Wi-Fi through the unit. And then it'll pick up if there's any updates through the system. So you don't even need a uh, memory card for that at the time. So you can do that um, directly. You can connect it to your home Wi-Fi if your garage or shed or kayak's just near the house. Um, the second option is through the computer, is jumping onto the Lorance website or onto Google, searching for Lorance software updates, and then finding your particular unit and finding the latest um, software update through the Lorance software update section and then just following the steps. Everything is really broken down quite simply um, and takes you through the process step-by-step step of what you need to do. So that will be uh, my recommendation for uh, updating your software, mate. All right, on to another more general brim fishing question. So Dale, once again, <laughs> say, <laughs> I'm guessing this is a bit of an in-joke, but it's a bit of a stitch up. Double well enjoy, played, DB, well played. <laughs> the benefit of a double uni knot over an FG knot as everyone would know, is it catches more brim and it catches bigger brim. <laughs> and it allows you allows me to tie it um, with my eyes closed in about 15 seconds flat. <laughs> so that's a bit of a stitch up. Well played, Dale. <laughs> All right. Stenko's asking what length of rods you use, Paul. Hey, Stenko. Um, look, for, for wintertime brimming, like, like I said at the start, um, answering Benny's question, especially around some of the the lures and the techniques that I use with soft plastics and some of those small vibes, um, I predominantly use a longer rod. So I use seven foot three Miller rods grub freaks. So they really got a nice sensitive tip, really super light, um, but amazing sensitivity. It allows me to make nice long casts. Um, and then I go down to about a seven footer for the most part on my Miller rods twitch freaks. So again, using those for vibes, using those for stick minnows. They're just a little bit heavier than the Grub Freak. Um, just allows me to get those fish out of structure if I need to. But at the same time, I think the seven foot is probably like that perfect all-rounder, whether you're in the kayak or the boat. Allows you to make nice skip casts um, underhanded around structure, but also allows you to get those lures out a long way. So I think seven foot to seven foot three is probably my uh, ideal sort of spot at the moment. And then I've got some shorter rods especially fishing around structure, you know, six footers, six foot sevens, uh, when I need to turn those fish's heads and get them out on heavier line. Very good, mate. We've got one final question. So guys, we're going to start wrapping up. We do have one last question. I'll bring it up now. Uh, if I can, if I can find it again. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, we've got two now. Dwayne's put one up as well. So uh, before that, um, <laughs> Harry's asking, Paul, why are you such a champion? I think we all know the answer to that. Anyone who's sat here through the last hour or so and picked up a ton of great tips um, that, that Paul's given away freely <laughs> knows exactly why he's such a champion. So. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Um, you need to take Pella out to uh, to catch a few fish with you, mate, you to teach him a thing or two. But uh, I hope Chris is watching as well. So the last couple of questions, guys. We've got a couple more that have just cropped up. If you've got, a, got another question, fire it through. We'll go another few minutes and then we'll start to wrap it up. So Dwayne's asking, can you identify freshwater on top of saltwater using your sounder? Hey, Dwayne, great question, mate. Uh, you absolutely can. We're kind of looking for, I call them thermoclines. Um, Greg, is it possible we could bring up some of those screenshots, please? I think I've yeah, got absolutely. a perfect image. You're really looking for, even in that, even what we're looking at there, um, Craig, so Dwayne, that um, on the left-hand side on our traditional sonar, in about a metre, you've got that really sort of thick red line. To me, that's that's the separation between the fresh and salt water. So I've got the fresh water sitting there on top. And for me, I've got the clean salt water underneath. I've got that salt wedge uh, between sort of 2.3 and 1, 1 1.2. And then I've got some fresh water sitting on top. So I use that um, that sort of dark line, sometimes it's a bit of a thinner line on the down imaging, um, but it's really quite clear, often quite clear um, and r really easily distinguishable on the sounder to uh, identify that fresh water on top of the salt. Well done. Absolute last question, guys. So Justin Costa is just after a few tips, mate, for the best lures to use in the Werribee River. There's, uh, there's probably about a gazillion of them, but let's just focus yeah. on yeah, over the next couple of months, over the winter months. Uh, for me, Justin, it, it still has to be the Grub and the uh, ZX Vibe. So I'll be looking with the Werribee River, if you're in the kayak or the boat and you're fishing the boat hulls in the bottom third of the river system, so closer to the boat ramp, um, things such as creature baits. So you've got you know your Dameki, Monster Mekis, your uh, Gulp Crabbies. And then as you head up the system, you've got obviously the, the natural structure, the natural bends of the river. Um, you've got some channel buoys, I guess, a bit up from those boats, boat holes. So fishing those deep drop-offs um, with grubs and um, ZX vibes, I find that those two are probably the, the two standouts for me, both on brim and estuary perch this time of year. Good stuff. Now, mate, we have had a couple of last minute questions. Do you want to keep going or you had enough? I'm happy to keep going if you want. I thought you, I thought you might be talking <laughs> fishing, so why would you want to stop? So, so Gaz is asking, mate, how many times have you had donut trips in the paddo? Mate, oh. we all have them. Let's just see how many uh, you've had. Yeah, I, I would have had them, Gaz. I haven't had one for a while. So as some of you guys might have seen, on my birthday, it probably took me about eight hours to catch a single brim. Um, I ended up doing it in a, <laughs> in a section really close to the floodgates. For those of you guys that know the paddo, um, that first section between the first floodgate and the bridge. So we've got a bunch, a series of pontoons. Um, and I'd, I'd fished the area earlier in the day, so it was a run out tide. Um, had one hit early in the day, spent the next six hours up and down the system, didn't have a touch. And then as I was leaving the system, you know, on my way back out, that tide had turned and it really pumping through that single floodgate at the moment as they're doing construction work in there. And I think it was the second or third pontoon from the floodgate where there was some really heavy current. But I, I, I you know, I found those fish on the side imaging and down imaging as I, um, as I was fishing my way around there. So I knew there was fish sitting under those pontoons, little, um, little grub under the pontoon, hopped it and finally got one. But that was probably as close as I've gotten to a donut out of the paddo uh, for the last couple of years. Like it's, it's really tough in there at the moment. Um, and the system's changed so much over the last few years. Like two years ago, this time this time of the year, it wasn't uncommon to catch 20 or 30 brim in a session um, and some really, really nice fish. So I think the paddo is just fishing a little bit tough at the moment. I think some of the, the current changes with that floodgate repair that they've got going on at the moment is probably making a bit of an impact. Might also have a bit of extra pressure that we haven't had for a little while. Um, I think there's probably a few more anglers in there than there used to be. Uh, but the other thing is it just, just seasonal. It's, you know, it swings and roundabouts, so to speak. It will come good in, in the next couple of months or it, um, next year we'll be fishing as it was a couple of years ago. So it's really just about giving it a couple of weeks rest 
coming back and I also find that picking the right tides and the right time uh, coinciding with the right time of day so something like a rising tide or a high tide early in the morning around eight nine o'clock it allows you to get on the water at a decent time at say seven just as the sun's come up or just as the sun's coming up you're out on the water and it's got that rising tide so you've always got flow in the system and you've got at least you know you're coming up to a, a time or a period where the water's quite high and generally those fish have either moved up onto the edges which have been previously exposed for the last you know six or eight hours now they're moving up on the flats onto onto those rock walls or they're sitting up under those pontoons and then as that tide uh, changes and starts to push back out at least you've got some water movement in the system that hopefully you know gets those fish to to trigger and bite a bit better and then you've got some food moving through the system with the current as well so that's what i look for in terms of timing of um, my trips so try and coincide a morning session with a early morning sort of high tide around that eight nine o'clock mark and then you can be off the water by midday and have a great day there you go that's how to avoid the donuts <laughs> a question from nick mate do you have a preferred color palette you use on traditional sonar in dirty water hey nico um for me it's color palette number 13 so clear water or dirty water i'm a huge fan of number 13 and the main reason for that is color palette 13 is a great differentiator for weed so weed really comes through as a nice bright green for me. Um, you've got that nice brown color along the bottom for our uh, for, for the bottom. Uh, but the big standout for me is the way that it interprets and uh, displays weed. So weed patches, um, you know, trees, shrubs, things like that. They really come through nice and clear as green. And it's also a really good benefit for those guys, you know, that do that fish for things other than just brim. So for the guys that are fishing for whiting out in the bay, the calamari, it's a fantastic colour palette. Um, and obviously for the guys who fish for, for bass, whether it's in Australia, overseas, um, a lot of that vegetation is really important for them. So I think colour palette 13 is a fantastic traditional colour, traditional sonar palette. There we go. All right. Look, there's two more questions, guys, and I'm going to, I absolutely am going to wrap it up after that. Um, so um, we have uh, Nat is asking, uh, do you ever use fish reveal function on down scan? Um, I, I used to, as you guys saw in some of the screenshots. I've actually taken it off in more recent times. Uh, and it's just a personal preference. There's absolutely no right or wrong answer to that. Um, I actually just prefer seeing some of those little blobs. Um, I'm quite confident in what I'm seeing. So when I see those little white rice grains, um, I'm also able to see some of those bigger blobs when I'm looking at fish such as snapper or mulloway and then looking at my traditional sonar and looking for those arches or partial arches and seeing the blobs on down scan. Um, I'm really happy with that. So more recently, I've taken fish reveal off. There we go. And the very last question, Paul, I see there's a couple more actually starting to spring up, but we are, we are going to stop. We, at some stage, we have to stop. So uh, this is a, a more general fishing question again. Yep. So when fishing Malacuta, do you prefer the top lake or the bottom lake for brim? Hey, guys, if I was just a, just a general answer, I would say the top lake for me. But I've definitely caught winning bags out of both systems. It's really time of year and both top lake and bottom lake could be holding fish, could be holding active fish. It's about trying to identify which part of the lake and which part of the system has got those slightly bigger fish. So these days with technology, with patterns, with lures, a lot of anglers are catching their five bag limits, especially in tournament situations. But it's how do you, how do you push yourself up the rankings and how do you get those slightly bigger fish? So it's not about spending time on a school um, that's kicking out 500 gram fish all day long. Like it's super fun. People come back, oh, I caught 50 fish, but they're all the same. You need to move on, especially after you got your five. There's no point sitting around sitting on that school of 500 grammers when you know guys are going to catch ones, 1.3s, 1.5s out of that place. Like you, there's no, I mean, we, we fish competitively um, in the tournaments, obviously, to try and do well. So yes, having a fun weekend is really important, but um, it's really important to try and identify the areas that are holding those bigger fish. So again, different times of year, they will move up and down that system. Um, yep, don't be afraid to you know target yellowfin all the way up to Gypsy Point. So we're talking about Top Lake and beyond. 
So those yellow fin just aren't sitting in the bottom lake anymore. They, they're well spread through the system at different times of the year. They will hold a lot more weight. And then at other times, you know, we've got 48, 49 centimetre fish, yellow fin, that are only weighing 1.3 because they've spawned out and they're just skinny dinner plates. And that's the time of year you really want to target blacks. So it's then identifying other blacks sitting on structure. Are they in the tea tree? Are they on those rock walls? Um, are they up around Gypsy Point? Or are they out on the mud? There's really, you know, quite a, quite a number of different places they could be sitting at Malakuta. And um, it's really about breaking up your day in trying to hit some of those places and then quickly establish a pattern and then keep hitting that pattern all around the system. So that's a really win long-winded answer for your question, but top lake, but then move around. It may have been a long way to answer, Paul, but I was watching the stats and I don't see anyone <laughs> dis disappearing. People are still <laughs> listening to what you have to say. And look, I want to thank you, mate. We promised everybody that tonight would be a masterclass in brim fishing and you have absolutely delivered on that promise. I want to thank you. I also want to thank Navico and Lawrence for allowing us to put these um, th these masterclasses on and to, and to help you guys along with your sonar. I hope you got lots of value out of it. Uh, if you did, make sure you leave some comments. Uh, let us know what you liked. Let us know if there's things you didn't like as well. We're always looking to improve. But, Paul, for everything that you've shared today, I really want to thank you. It's been tremendous talking to you. Uh, it's been a great opportunity to uh, to help some people get onto some brim over the next couple of months. I'm sure that would be well appreciated. So I'm going to let you be, mate. Folks, you remember that we will be running another masterclass same time next week. We're going to be talking about a bit more technical next week. We're going to be talking about uh, transducers for the Simrad units so if you're a simrad owner or you're interested in finding out more about choosing the right transducer for your simrad unit then next week is the go it's eight o'clock on monday night i'll see you then thanks again paul thanks greg pleasure see you guys signing off bye for now guys <laughs>